So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Queensland State Archives. I'm Louise Howard, the Queensland State Archivist. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Yuggera and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. As the State Archives is a place for learning, I also acknowledge the continuing role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as knowledge keepers who have their own keeping places. I extend that respect to all First Nations people joining us today, either here in the room or those who might be watching us online. So welcome everyone, both our in-person and our online audience. This is the last talk for 2023 with our partnership with the Harry Gentle Resource Centre um, from Griffith University, sharing how historians use QSA records to further their research. And I've just had some interesting conversations with our presenters on the records that we hold here and how we might be able to unlock the value of some of what we do have. To introduce our speaker, Deborah Jordan, I'd like to welcome Professor Mark Vinane, Director of the Harry Gentle Resource Centre. Uh, thanks very much, Louise. Um, we really value our partnership with Queensland State Archives. Um, the Harry Gentle Resource Centre has been um, holding these lectures in partnership with the archives over a number of years now, and it's a really crucial part of our work. Um, if you're here uh, or online, you probably know a little bit about the Harry Gentle Resource Centre, but it was established um, with a bequest from a Griffith uh, graduate uh, who wanted to see uh, greater attention to the uh, resources and study of early uh, colonial Australia. And the Harry Gentle Resource Centre was established with that bequest. Um, we've had uh, from the beginning, Lee Butterworth, who will be known to many people as a research fellow, who's uh, been the constant support for the work of the centre. And uh, one of the major functions of the centre has been the um, conduct of research by visiting fellows. Um, visiting fellowships is two or three a year, which are advertised nationally. Very pleased to say there's a high demand for these. And um, uh, they're typically people who are doing uh, very original uh, work across a range of, of areas of, of Queensland social, cultural and political history, uh, and sometimes going beyond Queensland now as well. Um, we're very honoured today to have Deborah Jordan, uh, one of uh, last year's uh, visiting fellows, to speak to us on the subject of uh, colonial feminism and the development of the suffrage movement in Queensland. Uh, Deborah is uh, uh, well known as a scholar of uh, Queensland women's history, particularly of the suffrage and of a variety of topics in, in Queensland's uh, social and cultural history to do with the position of women, uh, cultural, literary and social histories. Um, we're very honoured to have her speak today. She's about to um, publish her major study of uh, Queensland uh, suffrage movement, uh, Routledge Press, uh, Deborah's just told me, is to publish the study, uh, Australian Women's Justice, Settler Colonisation and the Queensland Vote, be published in December. So keep an eye out for it. Um, so uh, I welcome Deborah to the uh, speak to us on the question of Queensland uh, women's suffrage and particularly its early colonial antecedents. Thanks, Deborah. So thanks all for coming. And I'd also like to acknowledge Yuga and Turrbal elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to mention, acknowledge the Jindaburra people whose recent history, shared history, I will touch on. So when we start to add the stories of generous public-spirited women to our histories, truculent activists, and read the work of feisty woman journalists and intellectuals, we have a much richer view of the possibilities of the future. So when we take an international perspective, we can begin to see 
some of the comparatively phenomenal achievements of Queensland women on a global stage. Everyone knows of the Pankhursts and suffragettes who won the limited property vote in England in 1918, but the story I'm more interested in is how Queensland women contributed to winning the federal vote in 1902 and the state vote, one woman, one vote, in 1905. And if you will, all non-violently. Some of them went on to block the introduction of military conscription in 1916 and 1917 in the referendums. One of the key research questions of my current work has been on how did they actually achieve this and how did they win the vote? And let's name them. So in women's history, the shift to the study of gender and relations and theory happened fairly early, and there's a lot of gaps in Queensland's women's history so far. Today, I'll focus on the women <coughs> who arrived before separation in 1859, uh, drawing on the first book, in the chapter in my book. Uh, so for nearly a decade, I taught in uh, a course at Flinders University on... Australia and New Zealand from 1750 to 1850. And the focus, of course, was on South Australia. So a lot of the Queensland material is familiar, but also very, very, very different. I'm going to open with a quote from one of my favourite Queensland writers, Leontine Cooper, in an essay on Queensland girls in 1888. As is typical, she challenges us to think about how things uh, different, differently. And here she reflects on labour. Working lives are, of course, central to trying to understand women's history and how white women won the vote. So it didn't surprise me at all that the Queenslanders, 10 of 23, are at the heart of the Matildas. Here's Leontine. The indictment is brought against Queensland girls that their general tone savours more of the household than of the drawing room, that they are compelled to do domestic work in consequence of the limited supply of servants. And they do not rid themselves of the association with household matters, even in society, and consequently their conversation is uncultured and commonplace. This is a hard indictment, rendered harder by the fact that it is true, I think. I think I did. And that, though it is brought against them as a reproach, under one aspect, it is greatly redounds to their credit, for it shows that they have made a grand step to the, towards the full development of our nature in so much as they comprehend the dignity of labour. In luxurious England, it is almost a disgrace for a woman to work either in a household or to earn her bread. In Queensland, there is no such false pride. No woman is ashamed to take part in the domestic work or to have the fact known. And the woman who works for her living is honoured in a degree far above that conceded to her in the mother country. 1888, she wrote that. So the first task of course, is to actually identify these women. And let me give you an example. This is the uh, 1894 petition, One Woman, One Vote. You can see the, I can have a go at this. You can see the this first signature on the petition, Sarah Jane Lilly. She's, uh, she's, so there is a two full time full biographies of both her father and her husband, which have very little mention of her at all, and so this that's quite disappointing. But we know she had eight sons and five daughters. Yeah. Here she comes. So was she merely a figurehead, a celebrity endorser? She was asked to nominate as the president of the Women's Equal Franchise Association in 1894 at the Brisbane Big Public Meetings, suffrage meetings, and is elected to the council. At the even bigger regional meetings, she was very often sitting on the platform with a non-speaking role next to her husband. Even bigger regional suffrage meetings, yes, 
the regional suffrage meetings were bigger than the meetings held in Brisbane. So, so Charles Lilly was a very important advocate of women's suffrage, even if something of a maverick. He, he, and he has a legitimate place memorialised in King George Square. He spoke from the public platforms on a wide range of women's issues across the colony, including married women's property rights. So how do we define a suffragist, a colonial feminist? Someone who signs the petition. There's a second petition, 1897, calling for the removal of the disability of sex. So Charlotte E. Trundle, who's again the first signature, we only get as far as, where did it go there, Charlotte E. Trundle. She's actually the suffrage superintendent for the Women's Christian Temperance Union. She was born in 1845. She emigrated with her family, the Balls, Charlotte Ball she was, in 1862. And she married into the Trundle family. So the, these are the petitions that were transcribed by the Family History Society and digitalised, available on the Queensland Parliament website when John McCulloch uh, found them in the parliamentary archive. So, and they're pretty important given the lack of surviving manuscripts. So at least we have key figures. At least we could start to see women taking up political claims. So to return to Charlotte Trundle, we don't have a photo yet. Her story luckily has been picked up by the Umundi Historical Society. So she retired to Umundi in 1905 when the vote was won. And there's nothing much yet on the balls. But we do have the Trundle family. <coughs> so they left England in 1848, early in the era of free settlement. Fanny Trundle was yet another woman with an extraordinary number of children, 14 in all. She's an interesting person, poet, diarist, and she set up the first dame school in Fortitude Valley. One of her sons married Charlotte Ball. So Beth Robson's article notes how Fanny's last will and testament gave explicit instructions on how to divide her state, her estate, equally among her children, with her daughters to have sole and separate use independent of any husband. So in context of the wider debates over married women's property rights, this is quite a significant, in fact, and the rights of women with property in their name to have a local government vote, 1878. So within the families, they're setting up this notion of women with property so they can vote. We can return to Charles Lilly to, to explain. I think I've got it here. Yes. <clears throat> the man said at the altar to the woman, with my body I thee worship, with all my worldly goods I thee endow. From that moment he left the church door with her. He took every coin, every stick she possessed, and everything that came to her during their wedded lives. He could leave her to beggary in the streets and bestow all of the property if he chose upon his harlot. This was the law of England for centuries. So that's Charles Lilly. He's He's quite a... Character. His wife was sitting beside him at the time. Uh, the lack of legal status of married women, it's almost unbelievable now when you think about it, um, that they had no property rights once they married. And most Queenslanders, of course, a very high percentage of marriage. Uh, it was an issue that played out in most of their lives until the laws were amended, 1890, with, with the Married Women's Property Rights Act. And why is property so important? As we shall see, the cultural ideas about individual and community of ownership and rights was underpinned by changing concepts of common lands and clearances. This is in Britain at the time. Property ownership and possession and the real changes in the use and custodianship of 
territories in Australia. Two political and legal gendered systems of governance and their ensuring societies operated in 1842 when the district was officially opened up to free settlers. So women convicts in the early days of Orton Bay as a place of secondary punishment were only ever in small numbers. <clears throat> but through the petitions, we can start to suggest how they are, were aligned politically and we have been able to identify at least one returned elderly ex-convict living in Queensland who signed the 1894 petition. Some of these early settlers who experienced the long sea voyage, that's another motive that comes through quite clearly, and the cultural disruption went on to play a leading role in the call for women's rights. So what happens on the three, four months trip is uh, often the there's only a very few uh, first class passengers. Mary McConnell's a case in point. Um, so what they do, these young women who are travelling first class, they actually, the class barrier breaks down because they associate with the the, the, all the young women with children in the in the next class down. Uh, for eons, the sustainable tribal nations with a sophisticated system of land custodianship and responsibilities, complex and consultative government and legal structures and set of relations with neighbouring peoples lived in the lands. <clears throat> Unlike under the British Imperial Code, First Nations women's played a central role in their communities with distinct rights and responsibilities as medicine women, initiates and elders, with her own sacred borough grounds and councils, sometimes meeting separately and at other times as part of the wider community. The Australian wars across the continent involved different and variable fronts as colonial governments, imperial officers, white settlers and pastoralists came into violent contact and violent conflict over land with Indigenous custodians. So unlike the establishment <clears throat> of some of the other colonies, very little attempt was made to conciliate with First Nations people in Queensland. So... When we look at suffrage historiography, Eileen Morton Robson's critique of whiteness and white possessiveness still stands, if not her assumptions about the middle class nature of the movement. Labor historians, just run through for you some of the historiography, uh, <clears throat> labor historians such as Pam Young, whose groundbreaking work on Emma Miller, uh, finds that the Labor Party and the Labor movement was instrumental. Jessica Patton revisits the class divide. While much good research is still tucked away in theses, studies of middle-class women or elite women, such as Elizabeth Brentnell and those involved in early women's clubs, often associated with the Queensland women's electoral, electoral lobby, including Margaret Ogg or Eileen, Irene Longman, are available. National studies include some material on Queensland and the important early work of Audrey Oldfield and Kirsty Lees and, of course, Claire Wright, who opens up the field again. And of, a lot of who I'm following is Lee's work through the Australian Women's Historical Register. But it's Really, when we start to look at the women's movement in the broadest international context, can we start to analyse the way race and gender intersect? Okay. Another way of identifying key suffragists is to look at the de deputations. So here, Lady O'Connell wife of the Legislative Council's President, Madame Clark, the wife of the Mayor, R. Edwards, Elizabeth Edwards, the wife of Chapman and Edwards, big department store, <coughs> the Francis family I touch on. <coughs> Roe, of course, is the wife of the headmaster of the boys' grammar school. 
Miss Griffith, probably Susanna Griffith. Who I'm going to pick up and talk about is Mary McConnell. She arrived in 1848, 49, as a young bride, quite early. When she called for the vote, she argued that it was not alone because of women's equality with men. Hers is a generous but conventional claim based on the separate spheres of the sexes that they, men and women, stood on their different interests and different points of view. And they held that these differences necessitated that they should be in a position to appoint their representatives. They hoped in some measure to strengthen the mind of the state, not only for the good of women, but for the benefit of all. By 1890s, at the height of the suffrage movement, she's one of the most highly respected and senior white women in the colony. She's in her 70s. But she grew up in the era of chaperons, crinolines, bonnets, domesticity, financial dependence, no money because she's a married wife, uh, and more babies. So separate spheres and clearly demarcated responsibilities underpin this strict sexual division of labour. Yet arriving in the colony early in its violent history of colonisation as a new bride 50 years earlier, she had matured through engaging with the challenges, opportunities and ruptures in reaction to the widespread claim that a woman's femininity would be imperiled if she voted. Mary McConnell's response is quite interesting. She suggested that if it was not good for women to enter politics, at least it would be brave for them to do so. So brave when they knew, this is her when they knew that they were stronger in some matters than the men. So courage is a key ingredient for these women. Now, recently, Mary McConnell's been recognised by the state with an electorate named after her. She's not yet acknowledged as an advocate of the women's vote. In Queensland, she's recognised for her key role in establishing the Children's Hospital by senior Australian historians, including Anne Coythoys and Libby Collins, Connors, she's judged very severely for her role in the Australian wars. So before she married David Cannon McConnell, he took out a huge pastoral lease close to Brisbane of 153,000 acres and he's directly involved in the entrapment and killing of Indigenous warriors, documented in a letter he wrote to the Land Commissioner held here in these, this archive. So it's into this war zone Mary McConnell arrived in 1849, presumably pregnant. This was the year, the, <coughs> this was a year after the Native Police was set up, funded by the squatters. So the, the McConnells also had 200 acres at Belimba, now, Mary McConnell only lasts five years in the colonies. So this is where I start to speculate that she actually couldn't handle it. Uh, the McConnells also um, thought they, so they sell up the property at Belimba and they leave in 1853. So this is the height of the frontier wars in Queensland. That's okay. So she, she ran away. <laughs> But they take a, a seven-year-old child from Durandura Station, presumably an orphan, but certainly not. And they don't return to Queensland. They take this boy, Aboriginal boy, they take, take him away for nine years. And I think indicative of perhaps the trauma that she experienced, so she was sick and she lost a child, but how deeply traumatic the whole experience had been when she returns, she brings with her a bolt of red cloth for making dresses for the Jindabara women. In her memoirs, Mary McConnell directly addresses the issue of terra nullis. So she quotes one of the women who come up and work on the station as saying, this is all my yamen, all my land. So she, she acknowledges that Indigenous people are being displaced but, and she, instead of relying on the notion of terra nullis, she talks about the Protestant uh, concept of 
how hard work and frugality are thought to be two important applications of being a steward of what God had given them. Uh, so it's an accepted... Um, Bruce Pascoe, of course, calls it a magnificent vanity to assume that God has chosen you to rule over all others, especially if you create the God yourself. When, when Angela Francis had South Sea Islanders looking after her young children, her fellow settlers thought that the black woman would eat the baby. The family with young children arrived in uh, 1862, the same year that Mary McConnell returned. The Francis's arrived on one of Henry Jordan's immigrant ships, travelling intermediate class, even though the father, her father had urged him to travel first class. So they select 70 acres up at the Brisbane River, tried to grow cotton, then sugar, employing both white and 15 indentured South Sea Islanders, two of whom had wives with them. Charlotte, born, born in 1866, the young girl, <coughs> was nurtured by the Kanaka, such was the race fears that fellow settlers assumed cannibalism. Charlotte, the daughter, was uh, to be one of the important rare voices when she demanded the inclusion of all women, black and white, in the right to vote. Indeed, her father, too, debated the issues of race at suffrage public meetings. So they're more open to different cultures than most. And Angela, the mother, uses Indigenous healing practices to successfully fight infection. Originally, I thought she might have been a Quaker as a way of explaining um, her differences, but there's no record that she was. So she goes on to establish a scheme for bushwoman to be trained in midwifery after l returning to London to study mid midwifery herself. And she works with the regional communities when her husband becomes a police magistrate. Angela, just as Mary McConnell, was a community builder and network able to cross class divides and continents expertise she drew on in setting up suffrage organisations. So an important strand of um, in what they call the imperial feminism is, of course, philanthropy. And it's one of the ways the early generation of settler women has been seen collectively working together and having an impact on the community and later policy. So, and the, 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 the way they theorise it is concepts of women's mission, Christian white female privilege and provincial providential imperialism could be deployed to create an expansive vision of independent British female agency and usually enacting a, what they call a maternalist Christian imperial mission to heathens, but it's not the pagan heathen that these Australian women turned their attention to, but the working poor, the women and children, and they established schools, churches, mothers' groups, bush nursing, homeless women's hostels and hospitals, and their success and failures give them the courage to demand more rights. So Mary... McConnell's strand of philanthropic agency contributed to, to powerful hegemonic ideas about women's mission to reshape the public Im image of imperialism. And this is quite important, I think, that they have a role reshaping the public image of imperialism from that of military conquest an economic exploitation to that of a social mission spreading Christianity and civilization. So how these race wars disappear is through this notion of women's missions reshaping the public image. So married women without property rights, they're actually structurally excluded when you think about it from engagement in the wars over territory. So First Nations people continued their traditional lives as best they could according to their laws, surviving on mission stations and safe properties. Now, Durandara 
we know is a, was a safe property. And I'm assuming that when Mary McConnell returns, so is Cresbrook where, where the family lived. So with the establishment of the nominated, you'll mostly all know all this, with the establishment of the nominated upper house and the Legislative Assembly in 1859, electors to the Legislative Assembly could have up, had could have plural votes. Now at the time, I think there was only 16 electorates at the time, but by 1894, by the 1890s, there were actually 72 electorates, so a man could have 72 votes in Queensland at the time. And in fact, some of them did claim. <laughs> the guy who introduced the Married Women's Property Act was quite happy to tell everybody he had 21 votes. So ownership of property, white ownership of property becomes a great dividing line and it underpins the economic development of the colony and through a series of displacements, property becomes the fault line on which women advocates divide. <clears throat> Suffragists divide over the strategy. So they divide over strategy, whether it's expedient to call for a vote on the same conditions of men or a call for justice, one woman, one vote. <laughs> So the next way to check out some of these, who they were, is to look at the actual history of the organisations. And we can start to identify the executives, people who are in the councils, who are the secretaries, who are the treasurers. And quick timeline. I mentioned 1832 because they keep referring to 70 years struggle and I'm thinking, what was 70 years? And it's the, it's the Reform Act in Britain that they talk, they, they're referring to. Uh, usually historians talk about 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention as a pivotal moment in feminism. Then we have 1859, the separation from New, New South Wales. The Crown, I put the Crown Lands Act, early in Act in there and then the arrival, of course, <coughs> the next generation, Leontine Cooper and Emma Miller in the 70s. Let's see if we can do this, go back. At the time of the establishment of the Queensland Parliament, uh, the first president of the Women's Franchise League, Emma Reading, she's only 15 years old. We know little about her life and work her life as yes, yet, uh, though there is research going on on her brother, Jess, a successful, uh, what do you want to call him, landowner, entrepreneur, developer, and her niece, and the, one of the very first female law graduates. What, what we can suggest about Emma Reading is how she... Um, fits in to this emerging stereotype of imperial feminism, uh, philanthropy and evangelicalism. But her husband dies young, 1876, so she's left with three small children as a single woman, uh, however much the extended family step up. But enough, clearly a wealthy background. And when we introduce this, the secretary, <coughs> Angus Cram, gets a little bit more interesting. She's a journalist, newspaper proprietor, poet, philanthropist. She arrives as a young wife, 1860s, and they go to Ipswich. She has a large family. Clearly the husband makes a bit of money. He, he dies. She marries a younger man, a fellow journalist, newspaper proprietor and editor. All uh, two, both of them were involved in the Lady Musgrave charity for homeless women and so was Elizabeth Brentnell, who's the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, so a long-term advocate of women's suffrage. 
she, uh, I think, was the president of the Lady Musgrave Lodge Committee. And the, clearly the committee provided the experience and expertise for those involved to take the step into direct political lobbying and engagement with the government. What's also interesting about Angus Keith is that she alerts us to the role of educated readers and writers. <clears throat> the emergence of women journalists in leading roles after the introduction of compulsory education for girls as well as boys and the th thriving school of arts. So the, and different things in place that weren't there before separation. Rather than seeing her as embodying an, an imperial feminism, we, she represents the emerging version of colonial feminism or Commonwealth feminisms. Leontine Cooper, who replaces Agnes Keith as a secretary in the second year, was a key leading women's rights advocate, publishing widely as a novelist, essayist and journalist. So her, her husband is a failed squatter, Leontine Cooper, Edward Cooper. And so whenever I come across pastoralists, I get a sinking feeling. And sure enough, the land he took up on a much smaller holding than the McConnells was near the site of the Whiteside massacre 20 years earlier. In her writings, I found no mention of by Cooper of, of that massacre, and her bush is eerily devoid of people. So that's 20 years on. But Edward Cooper had to sell up, and so we have Cooper's extraordinary literary opus, probably as a result, because she had to earn her keep. May Jordan is a different person altogether. Her parents married in 1859, the year Queensland was formally declared, and soon after May was born, the family sailed to London, where Henry Jordan was posted overseas to head up immigration promotions. May was the eldest of seven children, her mother, New Zealand-born Sarah Hopkins was the daughter of a missionary. So in Henry's different vision for the colony of white yeomen, farmers, white women were needed. Women were eligible. Now this is quite extraordinary really. Women, and it's through the Queensland State Archives, women are eligible in this period, 1860s, for land grants. On paying a full fare, each adult or two children received a voucher for £18 with a further land grant for £12 after two years' residence. So making all members of the family eligible for land, grant, for land orders was a considerable inducement, concludes Kenneth Morgan. More than this, it was a fundamental shift in the nature of property relations between man and woman. So single land use is becoming a transferable commodity. Initially, the scheme led to rife speculation as the land orders were bought and sold. So it's a step towards recognising women as working people, but it doesn't really fundamentally challenge the disparity between men and, men and women because it's only in limited places they can take up these land orders in, in agricultural reserves. Now, I think there's there's a lot more work that could be done here because the schemes keep shifting. And, of course, there's different criteria for domestic servants, single women. But the, the notion of married women who don't have property rights uh, being eligible for land grants is quite a paradox. Presumably, they have to uh, pass them over to the husband. Overall, the land grants were very successful and they increased the arrival of immigrants when compared with other colonies across the globe who used a bounty system or a subsidy paid to the ship owner. So on the, on the, when the Jordan family returned to South East Queensland, 1866, Henry took up land at Logan and ran a sugar plantation, all cultivated proudly using white labour. So May, May Jordan's a, a product of that family, a lifelong student and modern ed educator. So she trains through the Brisbane School of Arts, Technical College, taught private schools and state schools. And by the time she meets David Rose McConnor, the McConnell's second son, her interest in politics included 
an interest in the labour movement. So, so she's born 1860. She's a Queenslander. She married him on New Year's Eve in Brisbane 1890. So uh, she, she becomes a powerful advocate of the women's movement and she takes a very different perspective from that of her mother-in-law, Mary McConnell. So she's a member of that first suffrage league. We had a look at with Emma Reading and Agnes Cram, Keith. But she really emerges into prominence when she's appointed as the first organiser of the women's unions. So she was profoundly influenced by the journalist and visionary William Lane in his call for the workers' paradise and his sustained and attempts in tack. He's only in his 20s in the, 19, in the 1890s, 18, late 1880s, intense attack on bourgeois women and the pro possibility of a property vote. So the scene set for the great public rift. Next one. So this is the this is the resilient monument in Brisbane, and we have Mary McConnell, Mame Jordan McConnell, Emma Miller, and the third woman honoured is Margaret Ogg, who doesn't really have a lot to do with suffrage, but she has a lot to do with later period through electoral lobbying. <clears throat> so the scene is set for the great public rift between women in 1894 when women again mobilise in Queensland after the Maori and Pagana women win the vote in New Zealand. So this, the, the debate's really over strategy, whether you, you go expediency or dem democratic suffrage but it's underpinned by this property relation set in law with colonisation and the property and plural voting system. So the only way we can understand the conflict in the 1890s for four is when we see the bigger issues at stake. Uh, those women with husbands who had accumulated fortunes and whose philanthropy and charity led them to want change, came up against this next generation of Queensland-born young women and new immigrants who wanted justice. So the most articulate exponents and quite feisty write-ups in the newspapers were the newly arrived wealthy English immigrants with intact class expectations and the, those from the second generation of Queenslanders who actually working together from the floor, raising motions from the floor, who wanted justice and were prepared to openly confront their supposed betters. It was left to a Quaker woman, Mary McGuinney, to try and keep the movement together. So both Labor and elite women were elected to positions on this council. The elite women all either resigned or left. So the deputation, they, most of those women were on the initial council, but after the public meetings in 1894, they all resigned. Some of them went away and uh, joined Leontine Cooper in a breakaway women's franchise league. And really, for the next decade, the remaining Labor women in the Women's Equal Franchise Association, with Sarah Jane Lilly as their celebrity endorser, achieved the vote through in what they call indirect political influence and they made sure that they were represented by the Labor Party politicians who could push the legislation through. They were much more than mere lobbyists like the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They were an astute political savvy group who ensured their candidates after running a gauntlet of a meeting so they the young men, the union men came through and spoke to the women. They made sure they were elected by actually actively elect electioneering. So the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the other major, <laughs> the third group, continued to maintain its non-party political line and work with both factions. So each cohort of women faced different 
contemporary circumstances, not just in Queensland, but from across the globe. So you, different ways of looking at feminism, you can see it, see it as concept of waves, shifting campaigns, or Marilyn Lake, for instance, does uh, argues that the, there's ongoing gender relationship power struggles. So in the Australian context, I find Julie Kristeva's ideas are useful when she argues each feminist wave inherits the legacy of the earlier women's actions. And in the number of women-daughter combinations such as Charlotte and Eleanor Trundle or Elizabeth Brentnell and her daughter, even mother-in-law and daughter combinations like the Trundles or the McConnells, accommodation was made within the family. So Karen often talks of the volcanic eruptions of feminism in the European context but that can only be damned by war. But a better metaphor for Queensland, where we have no volcanoes, might be floods with a great wave of immigrants. And they inherited the mistakes and closures of early er eras. Early eras, 1871, Queensland Parliament, Charles Lilly proposes women be granted the vote on the same terms as men. It's actually the property vote. He later changes his mind. The squatters in power respond with a bill specifically excluding First Nations and people of colour from the right to vote, amended in 1885 and 1905, which took nearly 100 years to undo. Thank you, Deborah, for taking the time to share your research with us today um, and absolutely fascinating. I don't know if we have any questions from the room that anyone has for Deborah. Yes, one over here, Alicia. Thank you. Um, Chris Henderson Wolf. Um, Deborah, what what would you think those some of those key women you've 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 researched would have thought about the 1902 vote. Okay, so so you're looking at the the Labor women, and we've got the, the Women's Franchise League, which is the, more the professional women's only group. So Leontine Cooper, so she's getting a fairly elderly. She, um, 1902, so she talks about how it's, it's the biggest thing in that bill because more than half the adult population have the vote. So she, she welcomes it, and she, but she talks about the responsibilities of women to this vote, to look at both sides, to think about the claptrap of the press, and then it gets quite interesting. She talks about, she, she's quite disillusioned. She talks about how it will only make a small difference and the steps are very small. And what we must do is, uh, actually, I think I've got it written down because it's such a weird phrase. Uh, all we can do is look to the stream of tendency stream of tendency that makes for righteousness. So she, she doesn't see it as, as making a big difference. What she saw as really important was the married women's property rights. She saw that as the fundamental shift. Now, when it comes to Emma Miller, so Emma Miller is the Labor leader, quite charismatic. She, she has left very few records, but we have reports of two meetings for her. And she, she speaks from within inside the campaign. So this is why I mentioned the 1930, 1832 Act. She talks about 70 years of war. You know, we watch the, the battle of war, uh, the, how does it go? Something like the fruits of war we have won, you know. Not, not everything is in place, but this war has been going on for 70 years. And what's interesting, the only way you can think about how, how she's representing the campaign for women's rights is to see that they weren't demanding the right to vote because they wanted to be citizens, 
but they already were. If that makes sense. They already were. Hi, Deb. It's Dale. I'm from the Women's League for Peace and Freedom as well. Um, but I'm just reflecting. I wonder what role Queen Victoria played as a role model for the women. Yes. So I think it's quite important. Like um, whenever the issue came up of the in the press, you know, the, and we talked about Mary McConnell's response in peril. You know, femininity is in peril if you have the vote. Well, uh, Leontine Cooper would quote or picture Queen Victoria again and again. But there's an even better story about Queen Victoria. So we have a monument of Queen Victoria in that square in the city. Do you know it? Yeah. Yay. And Leontine Cooper wrote a letter to the editor and she said, the women of Queensland weren't asked. We don't want a monument of Queen Victoria. We want a university. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got an online question. Um, so this is a very this is very interesting. I was not aware of a lot of this. So do you have the full names of all the women who had signed these documents? So yes. So, so the the Brisbane Family History Society, Queensland Family History Society, transcribed the petitions. Absolutely incredible job. Very hard to read that writing. So it's online on the Queensland Parliament website. And it, it gives their maiden name, which is quite this is this is for genealogical reasons they were interested. Uh, it gives the maiden name and the address. Thanks, Deborah. One of um, your themes was the tension and relationship between First Nations dispossession, the reality of Queensland settlement, yep. and then the recognition by some of the women of the position of women. And uh, I think you mentioned Angela Francis as yes. somebody who expected uh, to see the vote uh, regardless of race. Uh, yes. Can you say a bit more about that legacy and whether that was more widely shared? and debated? Yes. Look, look. I think it was such a strong division between, you know, this notion of the plantation economy and introduction of South Sea Islanders. So I think the community was divided already and the labour movement was uh, quite strident about white labour because – and they were quite strident about women's labour too because they saw that as undercutting wages. So the Morleys were early, um, Arthur Morley, um, Francis and his wife. It was actually the daughter who spoke up. And it's pretty hard to tell because with, with the Women's Christian Temperance Union, they just didn't mention race. But the Labor women did. And the Labor women excluded black people of colour explicitly. <laughs> When they did the two petitions, they had um, one for men and one for women, and the women's petition excluded people. They didn't want the vote like the Maori vote. Um, so I think what happened is the dynamics of the debate when Charlotte Goodwin King, the daughter, spoke up uh, it didn't go very far because she was overpowered by the Labor women at that stage. But it came up again and again, and they did debate aliens for suffrage. <laughs> which, um, But I don't think – I think this is why I included the bit about uh, Charles Lilly in the amendment in 1871. So the barrier was set pretty high. And I think the Labor women were being expedient as much as anything else, you know. I've got another question from the online audience. Uh, thanks for that, Deborah. I'm interested in the way you define feminism or feminisms, plural. How does our understanding of Queensland feminism change if we look beyond suffrage, 
uh, suffrage agitators and include people like Rosa Prade, who explicitly used her fiction to explore issues such as domestic violence that were being ignored by suffrage agitators. Just a short answer. Just a short answer. Okay. Well, we're, we're talking more about the women's movement rather than feminism per se. And I think there's a huge number of feminisms. So, um, this, and being historians, we, we can ground it in individuals. So, Rosa Prade is another interesting case, and we're probably related to pastoralists, so we're a bit wary of going anywhere near her. But she, she, she wasn't. Um, of course, and I think uh, it's almost like I see them more as contributing to building a movement. So they talk about how if you're going to have a movement, you've got to have the language to talk about it in. You've got to have the, the kind of shared understandings of what women can be and do, and you get that through literature and novels. So... How does it go? How does that shape our understanding of feminisms? Let's talk about plural feminisms. Uh, I, I quite like to make the distinction between individual suffragists and women's movement because I think the women's movement was there and this is why Leontine Cooper is interesting. It wasn't only the vote. It was That was the last order of call. Yeah. Thank you again, Debra, and thank you also, I think, for uh, sharing the names of so many of these women because I think that is something that we, we lose through the stories of history that are perhaps not representative of all of the people that shaped Queensland and shaped our history and who we are. Um, so it's been, it's been fabulous. Um, some I had heard of, everyone's heard of Emma Miller and the, um, the hat pin, um, but it was wonderful to have some of the other uh, names shared and, and made more widely known as well. Um, so thank you to those who've joined us here and those who've joined us online. Um, we look forward to bringing you another QSA talk in the new year. Um, in the meantime, if you want to watch any of our past talks, they are available on our QSA YouTube channel. Thank you all. And I should say one more round of applause for Deborah as well. Yeah.